Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is John Grant. Uh, I go by the Agile Attorney, and um, you know I, I am uh, sort of this interesting hybrid of lawyer and project manager. That uh, you know, I, I guess according to the Richard Susskind book, uh, is supposed to be an up and coming uh, profession right now. So uh, ho hopefully, I'm in the right place at the right time. But uh, you know, my my real goal, I, I've um, I've been practicing law for a little over eight years now. I had uh, a, about a 10-year business career uh, before I went to law school. And uh, really, you know, the, the one thread that has gone throughout my career is that I, uh, I love process and I love process optimization. Um, or put another way, I'm, I'm inherently lazy and I don't like things that don't work efficiently. <laughs> so uh, I sort of have a compulsion and a, and a passion for uh, getting workflows and getting systems in place that will help people work as effectively as possible. Um, I'm also a stickler for customer service and customer value. I, uh, as you'll hear here in a minute, uh, I really do think that the key to any successful business, whether it be a product business or a service business like the law, is really getting to the core of what it is that your customers find valuable and streamlining your operations and your delivery and your product mix and, and really all of your operations to really put a laser focus on delivering that value. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get going. This is a, a, a slideshow that um, that I've given several times now, and uh, it, it, it evolves a little bit each time. Um, so if any of you have seen it before, um, then uh, hopefully you'll find some new things uh, than, than from last time. And for those of you seen it for the first time, uh, hope, hopefully you'll find it useful. So um, let's see here, whoops, gotta make sure I got my right uh, pointer, good. So my, my goals for this session, right, uh, no, number one is to discuss sort of the nature of efficiency. Um, I'd like to divulge uh, what I think to be the single step to improved operations, uh, and then ultimately convince you to build a Kanban board and then uh, you know, as, as a shout to Locus, uh, eventually start using one as part of your law practice management solution. And, and I have to say, you know, I, I, Harry and I have been speaking, you know, ch checking in with each other off and on for uh, many months now, really kind of since the beginning of the year. And, and I've been um, pushing agile met methodologies for lawyers for a couple of years and, and really even longer than that, uh, albeit in some different roles. And um, Harry's and, and Locus is really the f one of the first tools that I've seen that is really designed for lawyers that embraces agile methodologies and, and agile thinking. And, you know, I, I really do think and hopefully I can convince you a little bit today that um, there's some real advantages to taking an, an agile approach. So uh, my, my standard warning, I, I, I try to uh, get more into the why than the how. We, we will talk a little bit about the how, but, um, you know, there, there are lots of materials about the how out there. And, I, you know, again, my goal is to, to convince you why this is a good idea. Uh, and here you'll see, uh, you know, before I get too deep into it, this is sort of the very basic Kanban board. So uh, as, as you'll see, right, I sort of tried to make it look like I, I had some blue painters tape and yellow sticky notes. Um, I, I do have sort of a strong preference uh, uh, of building physical boards in the physical world uh, for learning this process. I think there's something really magical that happens with uh, the sort of kinesthetic ability to uh, touch the cards and move the cards and, and rearrange things. And then once you get the hang of it, then there's some, some other advantages to moving to more of an online system. So, uh, you know, I, I often ask this in front of a room, right? Who, who wants to make their practice more efficient? And uh, I quickly fall into my, uh, my gotcha, which is that efficiency by itself is a terrible goal. And, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of talk about efficiency in general um, as being something we want to do. But, you know, efficiency is really about getting sort of more things done with your time. And... For me, it's not about getting more things done. It's about making sure you're doing the right things, right? And so um, how do you know what are the right things? And I, I telegraphed this a little bit already. But, you know, to, to me, customer value is the only goal, right? And if you can get yourself focused on delivering customer value, then efficiency will actually be a highly desirable side effect.
but it's that focus on customer value that really sets the stage for gaining efficiency in the right parts of your practice. So uh, the better question, right, is who wants to deliver outstanding client value? And uh, the, the tricky part to that is, do, do you know what value is? And this is getting a little bit into, I guess, my own personal history of, of my journey. But I started out, uh, I have a blog that is, that is titled Legal Value Theory. And I really had been doing a lot of reading and, and you know, listening to webinars and, and lectures and other things where people were talking about things like value pricing, or you know, customers, uh, legal clients that feel like they're not getting a good value from their outside counsel, therefore they're asking for discounts or going for alternative fee arrangements or all these things. And, and it occurred to me that there wasn't really a good working definition for the term value. So I, I made an attempt, and you know, I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but, uh, but I am fascinated by it to try to define what value is and and really what I came down came up with and you know, obviously this is not my own invention this is through a lot of reading and, and other things but at its core value is about benefit minus investment right so what do you get out of it versus what you put into it um, the trick is is that most people think of investment as being sort of a money figure and really it's not right investment has a lot of different forms um, I've listed him here, right? Time, energy, effort, resources, which kind of includes money, uh, plus that sort of, uh, you know, hard to, to define opportunity cost that, that comes into play, right? Anytime you're, you're investing in one thing, uh, you could conceivably be investing, investing in something else. Uh, and then what's interesting is that this same sort of breakdown applies on the benefit side too, right? So, you know, when you're doing work for a client, it's not necessarily just about making them more money, right? It may be about um, doing something more quickly, about allowing them to conserve their energy for other resources or for put their effort towards other things. So, you know, when, when you're creating value for your clients and for your customers, um, you, you can touch on a lot of different areas. It, it isn't just a bottom line fiscal number, right? The, the economics is greater than just the monetary figure. And then, of course, the other problem is that value is often clouded by uh, these touchy-feely, uh, you know, the pink cloud of feelings. And um, and so, you know, it is important, right? And, and oftentimes, uh, we lawyers, and, and I think it, you know, diff different people are different, and, and folks that tend towards different practice areas can be different. But really, uh, you know, understanding um, what makes a particular client tick is is important, and one of the more interesting things that I that I learned in my research on value is that um, there's actually a reason, sort of uh, uh, anthropologically, why the word that we use for economic value is the same as the word that we use for sort of our personal values, those things that we find to be uh, most important in our lives. And so, you know, another way to define value is, is the satisfaction of a person's values. And um, again, that's, that's not a necessarily an easy thing to figure out, but, you know, one of the cores of delivering customer value and client value is you have to seek to understand what it is that your customers find valuable. So I'm going to go real quick through a tool that comes from the agile philosophies, right? And I, and I haven't talked really about what agile is, and maybe I'll take a minute to do that, right? A a agile is a, a, a set of tools. Um, it's could be, I, I tend to think of it more as a philosophy than any sort of specific set of doctrines, but there are some things that, that it has in common, right? And, and we're talking about capital A Agile, right? Of course, you know, lowercase a Agile means quick and nimble and responsive, um, right? And capital A Agile aspires to be all of those things, but really it comes specifically out of the world of software development and, and, um, and actually we'll have a few slides on this uh, in, in the future, but um, or, or in a few minutes, but um, you know the, the idea is that um, software developers that were coming out of the 80s and 90s and, and into the early 2000s really struggled with some of the project management and process improvement tools that were available to them at the time, and so 
they looked at a few different uh, areas, or there's a group of people really that came up with this uh, capital A Agile. Uh, there is a, an Agile manifesto uh, at agilemanifesto.org that you can read. It, it shows a picture of, uh, of, of all the folks that were in the room uh, at this sort of uh, kickoff thing that happened uh, at some ski resort in Utah, I think, uh, maybe Colorado. Um, you know, back in 2001, but the, the principles that are there are actually pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, but it has its roots also in lean, uh, which is lean manufacturing. Um, and uh, I, I kind of know from experience when I've done this in front of a live room that not a ton of lawyers know about lean manufacturing, but it's worth looking up a little bit. It's, it's also known as the Toyota production system or Toyota lean. Uh, there's there's a really great um, This American Life podcast episode that they um, uh, reissued recently about the NUMI plant. I think it's N-U-M-I uh, in California that was a joint venture between Toyota and General Motors. And it gets into some interesting things about uh, the differences between sort of the Toyota lean Japanese manufacturing approach and uh, the, the American traditional approach. And, um, you know, uh, to... to to stomp on the punchline a little bit, you know, as we know, Toyota is now the largest car manufacturer in the world, uh, and General Motors is emerging from bankruptcy. So uh, you can sort of see where it's going. So uh, getting back to my slides, right, um, this tool that comes out of Agile, it's a, there's a specific uh, Agile methodology known as Scrum. Uh, and again, I won't get too deep into the etymology, but I will use the words because I think it's important for those of you who are being exposed to this for the first time or for one of the first times to be able to go and, and do some searches around the Internet and, and learn more about these tools. Because um, a lot of the early sort of learning in the agile space came out of the Scrum methodology. And one of the things that Scrum uses is called the user story. And... The idea behind the user story, it's sort of this Mad Lib thing, right? And you fill in the blanks um, to be able to better understand what it is that your clients will be valuable or will find valuable. And the idea here is that when you write your to-do items um, as simply a set of tasks, uh, there's something that happens in your brain that sort of um, excludes other possible ways to solve a particular problem. So I try to be very conscious about um, writing my project plans or my, my, you know, my tasks, the, my to-do list items uh, as much as possible in the form of this user story. So you can kind of get the idea, right? As a user, as a blank, uh, I need to be able to do something uh, so that I can accomplish something, right? And um, Another shorter way of, of saying this is what's the problem I'm trying to solve, right? And, and I think for any of the work that you're doing, particularly if you hit a roadblock, um, one of the best tools available is to, to take a pause and just ask yourself, what's the problem I'm trying to solve here? Um, so uh, again, it's just one methodology. I won't go too, too in depth because I have a lot of other things that I hope to get to uh, in, in this session. But, you know, one of the ideas is that once you've understood what your user stories are and what it is that your customers value, you need to prioritize those activities that are going to deliver the most value, right? And, and I could even go one more layer deeper and say, finish those activities that deliver the most value at the smallest investment, right? Because the whole idea of, of value is, is uh, or the, sorry, that deliver for the most benefit at the lowest investment because value is that equation of, of benefit my investment. So, again, it's not about getting more things done. It's about getting the right things done. Um, you know, one of the things I, I often say with regards to efficiency is that um, a, an electric drill is a highly efficient hole machine. Um, and, and in the hands of a skilled carpenter who understands what it is that he or she is trying to build, um, you know, an electric drill can be a, a very powerful tool and can create a lot of efficiency. Um, but in the hands of a novice, uh, all it does is allow that person to put more holes in more things. And that's not necessarily going to generate a, a more positive outcome for the customer, for the client. So another way of saying, you know, uh, basically uh, getting the right things done is to finish those activities that solve your customer's most critical user stories first. And, you know, as, as I said before, right, the, the side effect, if you focus on customer value, 
then you will very naturally want to reduce or eliminate those activities that don't add customer value. Uh, and this is, this is a cornerstone of lean principles, right? And, and one of the things that, um, for those people who have heard of lean, uh, oftentimes what they know of lean is this idea of the seven waste. So sometimes people talk about the eight waste of lean. And, and in fact, I got some really good sort of, uh, uh, clickbait juice, uh, in one of my early blog posts when I put this up, um, the seven waste of lawyers. And really these are just the seven waste of lean, right? But, and, and the acknowledgement is that, um, lawyers are subject to them just as much as anyone else. And, and, you know, looking down this list, these are things that I, that I often hear, right. In, in working with um, in-house groups or with clients, uh, I, I would often hear things like um, my lawyer gives me a lot of stuff that I can't use. Uh, they give me things, they deliver their work in a format that I have to rework it in order for it to be usable. Um, you know, sometimes they overwork a problem. Uh, I never know when I'm going to get hear back from my lawyer, right? It sort of goes into a black hole and I'm not well communicated to about the timing of the delivery of the work. Um, I, I haven't heard this necessarily from clients, but I'm looking at number six, uh, pre-processing. And, and it's actually, there, there's a, I have lots of stories that I've either witnessed or heard where, um, lawyers have had to do a lot of rework on a problem because they got started too soon and they didn't have all the information uh, either from a client or from an opposing party and, and you get to work on a contract draft or a, um, you know, some other piece of work and you, you get that other piece of information that all of a sudden changes the way the contract is going to read or the way the argument is going to go and you wind up having to rewrite the whole thing and that's, that's a classic form of waste uh, from a lean standpoint. Right. So the easier definition of waste is, is basically any material or activity that is not adding customer value. Um, uh, you know, put another way, it's, it's the absence of customer value or it's any investment that you make that doesn't result in a customer benefit. And therefore, you have no reasonable expectation that your customer will pay you for that work. Um, now, we often will still bill for it anyway, and I'm, you know, not, I'm, I'm saying we generally is the legal profession, uh, not necessarily anyone on this call, but it, it is often the source of tension um, uh, around uh, this sort of work. So efficiency, right, the, the flip side of waste, um, really the definition of efficiency is an ability to deliver value with only the necessary time, energy, effort, and resources, um, or put another way, the absence of waste. So um, let's see, I, I, I think I'm more or less on schedule uh, for discussing the nature of efficiency. Uh, I don't see any questions popping up, but feel free to use the question box if, if uh, you have any questions about uh, about waste, about lean, um, about sort of the fundamentals of agile. Um, but until I see those questions, I'm going to consider this particular topic done. And I'm going to take a sip of my tea. And I should also say, Harry, feel free to chime in if you've got any questions too, since you're the one person I can hear uh, through, through this. No questions yet. Okay, sounds good. Um, great. Well, so I'm going to move on then. And, and actually, before I do, I, I'll, I'll show you just in the to-do column, um, you know, one of the things around this Kanban board, and I, I don't often sort of pause to, to talk about the board that I'm using through the course of this presentation, but, um, you know, a few minutes ago, I had this, uh, this last uh, card in the doing column. I've now moved it to done. Um, you know, the idea is that we should celebrate, right? I've now delivered, hopefully, um, a small increment of value to you. Um, it took about uh, a little over 15 minutes in order to do it, but hopefully we both found that uh, that was a good investment in your time and mine. Um, and now we can move on from it, right? Which isn't to say that there isn't more to talk about um, or more to learn in that topic, but I have basically uh, given you a, a reasonable a reasonable benefit for the investment that you've made. And in order to make progress, in order to move on to other things, we're going to call that done for now. Now, over in the to-do column, uh, I have two things left for now. Um, and they're, they're uh, ranked in order of priority. So relative vertical position in the column tells me which things are more important um, 
than others. And so I have sort of arbitrarily prioritized divulging the single step to improved operations uh, over convincing you to build a Kanban board. Now, I actually think convincing you to build a Kanban board is maybe the most important thing I will do. But I think talking about this next thing is a prerequisite, which is why I've got it first. So moving on, right, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what I think is the single step to improved operations. And to do that, we're going to talk about the theory of constraints. And th the theory of constraints is a concept. It, it actually predates Agile by, uh, I think, almost 20 years. It, it um, was sort of first articulated by um, a, a guy named uh, Dr. Elihu Goldratt. Uh, he was an Israeli physics professor that um, wound up working for, I believe, an American manufacturing company that was trying to take the principles that Lean, that Toyota had had invented around Lean and around the Toyota production system, and and what he noted was that his uh, company was trying to just sort of take the the whole thing. Um, as Toyota had implemented it and plop it down in their own manufacturing workflow. And not surprisingly, they were running into some problems doing it. And so uh, one of the things that he came up with um, as to why that was happening was that um, the, the, his company was basically making lots of improvements to their system based on what Toyota was doing, but they weren't taking the time to really understand where the improvements were needed. And his, his basic, you know, the basic concept behind the theory of constraints is that in any system, there is only one constraint that limits the flow of the entire system, right? And I've got the asterisk, right? Occasionally, but very rarely, there are two. So, you know, this is obviously a highly simplified diagram, but, uh, you know, step two here is that bottleneck that is restricting the flow of the entire system. Right. And and so and I think most people recognize this is true. Um, you know, if you're looking at sort of the original Japanese concepts, um, Taichi Ono is is one of the fathers of lean. And uh, not surprisingly, there's some very uh, interesting sort of Eastern philosophical thoughts around it. And so you'll see lots of um, allusions to the flow of a river uh, or other bodies of water, which I think are always nice. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, if you think of a, of a typical river, there's usually some bottleneck or canyon or something that really does constrict the flow of the entire system. And there really are two sort of important corollaries that come out of this basic concept, right? Number one is that if you can improve the flow at your bottleneck or at your constraint, then you can improve the flow of the entire system. So when I talk about there being one step to improving your legal workflows, that one step is to improve the flow of the constraint. Now, that's a little easier said than done, and, and we'll get into some tools for finding the constraint. But, but it's an important thing to recognize that, you know, with all the, the information that we get and are bombarded with on a regular basis about understanding um, you are, or sorry, thinking of things that you can do to, to improve different parts of your legal workflow or, or to increase your productivity in different areas. Um, they're all good ideas, or at least most of them are. But if they're proposing that you work on something that isn't actually your current constraint, then it's not actually going to help you improve the flow of your system. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Well, and it, it sort of that, that gets into the other corollary. And this is the thing that people struggle with is that any changes you make to improve the flow of your system at some part that is not the constraint can't improve your system, right? So, and again, going back to this diagram, if you try to improve the flow at the intake step, um, that's all well and good. And you could do that. You could create a very highly efficient, although localized efficiency at intake, but you're still going to neck down when you get to step two. So the, the improvement that you make and the more than that, thinking back to waste, the investment you make in improving your workflow at the intake step or at step one, all that will do is increase pressure on your bottleneck, right? And, and, you know, even if you're helping in that localized area, you may actually put more stress on the overall system because it, it's the bottleneck that we find stressful, both both in a physical and sort of a metaphysical sense, right? The flip side, if you were to improve the workflow at step three or at that completion phase, 
um, you'd leave it starved for resources, right? And, and the way I've drawn this is step three already is starved for resources. Step two is limiting the amount of work that step three can accomplish. So even though it's a big part of the pipe, it's not doing us any good right now. So, you know, again, getting back to waste, it's investment without benefit, the absence of value, um, or put another way, right, pre-processing um, or over-processing, right? You can be working on parts of your system that aren't actually going to help your overall workflow improve with, within your practice, right? And so, you know, I said before that efficiency is a terrible goal, and really, uh, even worse than efficiency is just localized efficiency, because what the theory of constraints tells us is that system-wide flow is, is the important goal, right? And, and again, one of the ways to find system-wide flow is to focus on that delivery of, of customer value. So I sort of, uh, I, I, I telegraphed uh, this slide, but you know, these are all the headline, bunch of headlines that I found not too long ago. Um, you know, five steps to handle email and outlook, five steps to improve your website, uh, you know, using the customer lifestyle management, I think is what CLM is, uh, improve your billing efficiency, um, improve client satisfaction, improve your intake, right? The, I'm sure these articles are all full of, of very good information, but, you know, for 80, 90% of you, I don't know if any of these would apply. Um, you can often spend a lot of time and effort. Uh, and in fact, one of the things, I, I have a, a blog post from a, a month or two ago where you know, one of the things that I kept hearing from, from lawyers that I work with uh, is that when they sit down to improve their processes, um, they have a tendency to want to take it from left to right. And so they keep improving their intake process because it's, it's the first piece. And, and what happens is they'll do some work, improve the intake, and it may get a little better, it may not, but because it's not the bottleneck, it's not actually generating a system-wide benefit, right, either for the client or, or for the attorney or, or the team. And so it actually gets frustrating to work on that. And so you sort of peter out and you lose energy. And then, uh, you know, maybe several months can go by without, um, without actually uh, – uh, working on any part of your process and then something will drive you crazy and you'll go back and say, darn it, I'm going to fix my process again. Uh, but what everyone does is then they start over at intake. And so they wind up sort of um, going in this vicious cycle of, of improving some part of their system that, that typically isn't the bottleneck. Uh, I'm actually going to skip a few slides. I just realized that I, I'm, I'm using it. Yeah. We have a question here. So sure. the question is, you know, like if we have like overly last step, for example, discovery, so should the, the lawyers, they should break the discovery like in smaller steps, like deposition, sending discovery? You know, so, so that, that begs an interesting question, right? So, so my answer to that um, is, is, is have you already identified discovery overall as a bottleneck? So one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to jump forward maybe in my deck because I, I've got a slide that I think, uh, and I apologize for the, um, you guys see everything that's going on, but uh, uh, I'm going to go into something. Let's see, I'm looking for this one, right? So so here's, here's a very generic workflow around um, – legal work, right? And, 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 and when I say generic, I mean, these, these are sort of roughly phases that could work for either discovery or sorry, e either transactional work or litigation work. And, you know, the, the answer to the question of whether, um, so right, the, the, the gather or the research phase might be the equivalent of discovery. And, and again, I, I don't pretend that this is necessarily uh, useful for any individual law practice, but it's a good model to sort of build out and say, what do you, what do you um, use for these, what terms do you use for these different phases for your particular practice, right? Whether it be litigation or transaction or, or some combination of both. And so the, the question about whether to build out or, or break down discovery into multiple phases, the first question I would ask, um, again, is whether discovery seems to be your bottleneck. And yes, one of the ways that you can, yeah. So 
if discovery is a bottleneck, then that's actually an indication that you need to drill in to that particular part of your workflow to see if there's some sub piece of discovery that is the true bottleneck, right? And so in that situation, if, if you were to basically map your uh, client work in, in your litigation practice on a Kanban board, or again, this is, this is a highly generic one, but, um, and say, okay, I, I, in this information gathering phase is where the bottleneck is because that's where the work seems to be stacking up. But if, if instead, right, if the work were stacked up in the research phase, right, and we call that maybe discovery in the context of litigation, then that would be an indication that, yeah, it would be a good, a good idea maybe to break that into multiple pieces so that you can get a truer sense of where the specific bottleneck lies. The flip side is, is if your, you know, if your Kanban board looks like this, um, and you don't have a bottleneck in the research phase, then there's no reason to go into detail there, right? So until you actually, uh, sort of figure out that that is your choke point, then leave it high level and, and don't drill down into, uh, more detailed levels unless you have a, you know, justification for doing so. So I hope that I hope that helps. I'm not sure. I'm not seeing the question. So uh, Terry, I'm I'm dependent on you to get the feedback through. I have a question here. You know, I think you answered. So you know, like I have few users who are using like a specific workflows. Like for let's say for litigation, like they have like information gathering, then like the discovery. I think you have seen the the workflows which we have. So what yeah. you like what you advise users to to start you know like should they start with to do doing done or they should directly go to more specific workflows like we have like as as a template in our in our application yeah so you know i i think it's important to understand the to do doing and done conceptually and and i think there are times where even that most basic kanban board and let me go see if i can find it here um, right. And I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump around. So here's the basic to do doing and done. Um, and, uh, obviously I'm moving on to, to convince you to build a Kanban board, but I think it, it flows pretty well. Let me, I'm just going to move backwards. Oh, so the one thing, right. Oh, I, I, yeah, sorry. Now I see what I've skipped. Um, I, I, I'm going to skip it for now and maybe come back to it. So again, I apologize the, uh, uh, blowing through slides, but, um, I always like for these things to be a little more organic. So hopefully this will help. So this is sort of the platonic Kanban board, right? It doesn't, it doesn't reduce down to anything more simple than this. Um, right. I mean, I suppose if you were in a checklist, uh, philosophy, then you take it down to a binary decision, right? It's either to do or it's done. Um, and it, it, and one of, I think the advantages of a Kanban based workflow over a pure checklist workflow is that I do think that you get something out of that doing column. I think, um, for, for a number of reasons, uh, number one is it acknowledges those things where, where you are focusing your attention now, uh, and it helps with that prioritization. Uh, number two, and, and, and I'm jumping around uh, again, and Harry, I'll get back to your question, but there's this, um, co concept, and uh, anyone who's read my blog, uh, or follows me on Twitter knows that I often rail against multitasking. And, you know, there's tons of brain science and, and social science, and, and even now more and more, um, uh, research within the business community. In fact, the, the one I, uh, read just this week had to do with a study that Microsoft conducted internally on their, um, on their workers. And, and what they found is, is that, um, is consistent with what other researchers have found and is, is that multitasking is actually, uh, does far more harm than good. And that sort of two things come into play when you're trying to carry too many things in your doing column, right? Um, and again, part of the purpose of, of using Kanban and using visual management systems in general is to, to give you a view into those things that, that you may be carrying in your head or, or, or be present uh, on your devices, but are difficult to perceive. And by giving them physical form and, and specifically visual form, um, your brain can work on these problems differently. And so part of what I like about having a Kanban board or a visual board is that you can acknowledge all of the items that you have in your doing column, right? And, and typically it's going to be more than one uh, thing that your brain is working on at any given moment. Um, but acknowledge that you do have a finite capacity and that there is the potential for overload. 
And the problems of multitasking, uh, like I said, there's, there's a carrying cost. So having all these different things in flight, um, your brain has trouble letting them go. And so while you're working on one thing, if you have many other things in flight, your brain will want to drift onto some of the other problems. And that's inefficient, right? Because you're not getting the thing done that you mean to be getting done. Uh, but what they, what researchers have found and what this Microsoft study has reinforced is that there's also a very high switching cost uh, of your brain going back and forth between different tasks. And, and they found that, you know, for, for their workers, a Microsoft worker, right, a programmer, marketing, doesn't matter. Um, when they were distracted from a, an important task by something as simple as, as an email ding um, or a text message coming in, they could very quickly switch over and answer that email or that text message, or maybe not even not answer it, but look at it. But that act of taking the brain away from the task at hand causes it to go into this sort of free fall zone where it they don't typically get back to the thing that they were working on um, for an average of 15 minutes, right? So one email ding can cost you 15 minutes in lost productivity. Uh, in the course of your day. So one of the purposes of, of having the doing column, again, separate from a checklist, is that it forces you to acknowledge the things that are most important and those things that you should be doing now. And the, you know, it, it, there are two pieces to that, of course. You are acknowledging those things that you are doing, but you also, it forces you to exclude those things that you are not doing, and it gives you a framework for doing that. So um, that's that's the, the, the basic platonic uh, three-column Kanban board. Now, there actually are two different types of boards um, that, that can flow out of this. And one of them I call a productivity board. Um, uh, others call it a personal Kanban. Um, and there's a whole book around personal Kanban that, that is good. Um, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the authors right now. I know they're up in Seattle, but uh, <laughs> so it's not helpful. But if you Google personal Kanban, um, you'll come up with it. And the reason I don't call it personal Kanban is that I find that this productivity style board actually works very well with teams. And with a productivity Kanban, Basically, what you're doing is breaking out the to-do column into multiple steps, right? So uh, at the far left, I call it the backlog, um, and then you move into the queue, and then into the to-do, or sometimes the ready column. Uh, I think I maybe rename it on the next slide. Um, the thing that I'm actively doing, right? Um, the waiting column, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then the done is is the done, of course, right? And so I often think of, of the sub- titles of this um, productivity Kanban is looking like this. So the, the backlog is your brain dump, right? And, and I've, um, I've, I've taken a saying that it's, it's a little bit like for those of you that have done yoga or ever done meditation um, or guided meditation, you'll often hear people that the person who's leading it say things like, uh, you know, acknowledge the thought that enters your head and then set it aside, let it go. And this backlog column or the brain dump column is, is this place to set those things aside. So you're not going to be able to stop your brain from thinking of new things, right? It's, it's something that, you know, certainly we all do. We have overactive imaginations. But what this backlog or this brain dump allows you to do is to basically give form, right? Write down a sticky, throw it in the backlog column, and then let it go. Um, the queue, right? So, and, and then what we do is we have this, this sort of process of winnowing or funneling those ideas that you have into good ideas. Um, and, and then not only to good ideas, but good and timely ideas, ideas that are ready for work. Um, and so over the course of whatever the time period is, and, and in this case, uh, I called it this week. Um, I worked with a client last week who decided that the backlog was going to be where he held ideas that were more than three months out. Um, he has a queue um, that is for things that he hopes to accomplish in the next quarter. Um, then he has a, a sort of a, a um, another column, I can't remember now what we called it, um, that was the things that he's hoped to accomplish in the next month, um, all the way down to to do, which actually would be things that he hoped to accomplish this week. So it was a funnel of all the things and all the ideas that, that he had or that he and his boss and his team members had. Um, 
in order to funnel them down into those things that they're actually working on today or actually working on right now. Um, right, and you can sort of throw lots of different things in here. So, uh, and, and I won't read through all these, but these are just things that, that I think are sometimes useful to, um, uh, to talk about. Um, at least you know, give you give you an initial exposure to those things. But you know, again, I'm still working on convincing you to um, to build a Kanban board. Uh, I'm actually cheating right now, uh, and I'm talking about personal Kanban versus workflow Kanban um, without being done convincing you. Maybe, maybe these are related tasks. I'm not sure. Um, and I will talk a little bit about physical boards versus software tools uh, because Locus has built uh, actually a very fine software tool. And I, and I say that um, com completely honestly uh, and would say that even if we weren't on a Locus webinar because um, I've, I've been very impressed with what uh, Harry and his team have been able to come up with. Um, so here's some examples of a workflow board actually in use. Uh, this, this is in a law office. This is one of my uh, early clients and, and he built this board um, to, to get it going. Um, uh, here's another one. Uh, Greg is up, in, uh, is up in Seattle and we sort of chatted on the phone for a while. He'd read some things about my blog and uh, went out and ordered himself some painter's tape and a box of sticky notes and uh, built himself a board, right? Um, so there's lots of different ways to do it, but where this kind of a board, this workflow, or sorry, this, this productivity board is useful is when you have lots of different types of projects or, or tasks or stories that you're working on that don't have a consistent workflow, right? So a, a productivity board might be useful to, to map out your total office operations for your law practice or for your team, right? So you've got things like marketing you need to handle. You've got, you know, financial stuff you need to handle. You may have, um, you know, obviously client work. Um, there may be some operation stuff. You may have some personal things. Um, those all would be well suited to go onto something, you know, a, a productivity board like this, um, You'll see one of the cards they have on here is to mention color as a visual indicator. So I've worked with with lawyers and, and teams that will give different, you know, when they're using a productivity board like this, they'll give different colors to different types of work. So uh, finance is often green uh, for obvious reasons, um, but they may, you know, they may pick uh, orange for um, marketing or you know, yellow for um, operations work, things like that, and, and customer work usually gets a nice bright color too. Um, and, and sometimes customer work doesn't even go on this board and, and people will maintain more than one. So they'll have sort of a, a productivity board for their internal processes. Um, and then they'll move to the other type of board that I call a workflow board um, for their other work. So the workflow board, right, we've seen this uh, before, but whereas the, the productivity board is really an expansion of the to-do column, um, what a workflow board is, is an expansion of the doing column, right? So you see I put doing as the, the sub or the, the, the umbrella section uh, over this whole thing. And so again, this is a very high level legal workflow, but I wanted to try to break it down into the, the, the most basic possible steps and, and signing maybe should be execution um, or finalization. Um, but the idea is that where you have consistent steps, you can use the, the product, or sorry, you can use the workflow board in order to get a high level vis visualization um, not just of the work that you have, but where it is in your system and where it belongs um, within your particular workflow. Um, and as I said before, right, you can sort of use the theory of constraints to, um, number one, identify bottlenecks. So in this particular example, there's, there's a potential bottleneck at the gather stage. Um, uh, another word for this is client homework. And, uh, you know, uh, certainly is my experience working with other lawyers that client homework is often the bottleneck in a legal practice. They spend a lot of time waiting on clients to return things. Um, and so what this helps you do is, is acknowledge that there's a bottleneck there. And, you know, frankly, if you could get more clients to return their homework faster, uh, you probably could be making more money, right? Because if you can push it through into these later phases that you have control over, uh, more or less, right? Um, then, then you might be able to um, improve the number of matters that you handle. And you know, certainly, if you're if you're doing flat fee work, then the 
the benefit of that is obvious, but even where you're billing hourly, um, you know, there, there's a, there's, again, there's a carrying cost to holding a bunch of work in your system. Uh, but also if you can push, you know, close more matters over time, you'll, you'll actually be busier. Um, and, and therefore you can be more profitable on, um, on an hourly basis as well. So here, here's an example of, of, a um, Productivity board. This is a, a family law firm that I've worked with. Uh, I've, I, as you see, I've sort of tried to gray out, uh, hopefully, the client names, um, right? But uh, at the far left is intake, and, and at the far right is closing, and they've got very high-level phases, um, right? And it, you know, they, they've done a few things. Um, this uh, horizontal line along the bottom is kind of their waiting line. So. Um, you know, not surprisingly with family law, they, they get a lot of clients in the door um, that maybe have, have had some fights or hit the wall and, and uh, they decide that they want a divorce. But then, you know, things cool off and maybe things are better. So where, where things have cooled off, they will drop, um, drop the card below the line so that they don't lose track of it on the board. And they understand that this is part of their sort of overall load, but they're not matters that are getting active attention from the firm right now. Um, a few other things to, to point out on here, and this is getting into a little bit more advanced level, but um, number one, they use the card to be an information radiator. So you'll see dollar signs or dollar figures on the cards. Um, that's the client trust balance. Um, and if you look, you'll see a few of them are red, uh, which means that the client owes money. And so they're using the Kanban board to basically signal to the attorneys and staff in this firm um, sort of how much runway they have in terms of, of uh, what the client's paid and whether the client owes money. And, you know, certainly if they encounter a card that they need to work on, but it's got a red number on it, that's a visual indicator to them to um, try to go get some more funds into the trust account before they continue the work. Um, some other things, the, uh, you'll see the, the, the cards with the letters on them. Those correspond to people in the firm. And so what it allows the team to do is see who's working on what um, at any given moment. And um, each person gets a finite number of those cards because we each have finite capacity, right? We can't work on everything all at once. So it forces us to prioritize those things that are our current obligations, and then we free up our capacity to work on the next highest priority uh, after that. Um, the other thing that, I'll, that I want to show, and, and um, it, you can't see it very well, but these uh, you'll see above a couple of the columns, there's a list, right, is the, the white and gray paper. And that's actually a checklist. And, um, and then on the cards themselves, you see uh, the, the label maker tape that have numbers uh, like one through nine on them. And, and what they're doing here, and this is actually their idea, and I, I, I think it's brilliant, and I am stealing from it liberally, um, is that the, the checklists are, were, were my idea. And, and basically for each column in the board, um, what you want to do is have a definition of done for that column, right? So what are all the things that you hope to accomplish in that stage uh, that you will be able to tell now when you tick the items off the list that you are done with that stage and you're ready to move on to the next one. And actually the way we built that definition of done is that we started with two separate checklists. Uh, and, and the first is called the definition of ready. Um, and so the definition of ready is what are all the prerequisites that must be true before I can begin work on this phase. And then the definition of done is what are all the things that, that need to happen while I'm working on it in this phase. And then you have ready, done, ready, done. And, and, and what happens is eventually the definition of ready from a preceding stage will merge into the definitions of done. Uh, or sorry, the, the definition of ready for a downstream stage will merge into the definition of done for an upstream stage, uh, right? And usually it's the immediate stage, but sometimes it can be a few stages back. And, and that way you make sure that you don't have backflow, right? What, one of the things, you know, we talk about, and again, it's, it's a Japanese concept to have uh, consistent flow. And one of those things is you want to have forward flow. And um, Sometimes this gets into some of the lean concepts of pre-work or rework, right? If you move something into, let's say, the uh, initial filing stage for this particular litigation team, um, but you find out that there's some piece of information that you haven't gathered yet and you can't complete the filing, then really what you have to do is go back to rework your intake, 
uh, and you want to make sure, right? And, and, and that's okay if you do it once, but the idea is you can use these checklists and these stage gates to basically prevent it from happening again. So when you get into your initial filings and you say, oh gosh, I really needed to get yeah, you know, social security number or, uh, you know, an income statement or any, you know, what, whatever it might be, um, and you go back to gather it again, that's an indicator that you need to add something to that definition of done checklist for the intake phase so that on the next matter that comes through, you don't run into the same problem. And really what you're doing now is process improvement, right? So you're using your actual matters and your actual workflows to improve your processes and, and you set up this system of you know, visual management and stage gates and these definitions of done to prevent you from building systems that have consistent quality control problems, right? You, you, can, you can enact quality control on a stage by stage basis and, and improve upon it over time. So uh, Harry, does that get to the question? It's a very long way of, of getting to it and I forget even what the exact question was, but um, does that cover what you were looking for? Yes. John, we have one more follow-up question. You know, like, if a user has to, you know, like, they have to, like, break in this intake, like, intake stage, like, what approach they should follow up, like, to, to break this into, like, into smaller stages? Well, so, you know, one of the things that, that, that I'm uh, fond of saying is is to beware of unnecessary complexification. Uh, so, uh, which of course means keep it simple, right? Uh, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, my thing is, is if, if you can break intake into two pieces, start there, right? And, and if you can't learn what you're trying to learn by looking at it in two pieces and you need to add a third, then add the third. But if you learn something from the two pieces and you can think of an experiment, you know, you think of a, a, an improvement that you can make and you can then measure whether that improvement has an impact not only on the intake stage, right? You can sort of time or keep, keep track of some data, um, right? And I'm jumping ahead. This is one of the benefits of a software tool is that it's really great to gather data um, using software, right? So the, it, computers are really good at counting and math. Uh, and so you don't have to spend a lot of time doing your your data gathering. Um, the flip side of that is is that excess data is actually a form of waste, right? You you can have too much information, and and that can cause you to maybe go down, look at the wrong things, or, or rabbit holes. So there's there's a trade off when it comes to data and analysis and and measurement as well. But uh, you know, overall, software is very good at at gathering data, and and specifically, uh, I know Harry and and the Locus team are working on some high good high level metrics um, that uh, that show up when you are moving tasks through their board using using their Kanban system. Um, but, you know, my whole thing is, again, if, if, if you think your problem is at intake, right, take some initial measurements to say, okay, well, how long is intake uh, taking me, both in terms of my working time and also in terms of my elapsed time, right? So does it take me three days to do intake, even though it's only an hour's worth of work? Um, does it take me a week? Does it take me half a day? Um, you know, those are all important uh, in, in, in interesting things to do because you may want to um, adjust for different metrics depending on where you where you perceive the problem to be. Um, and then, you know, once you've done that measurement, right, and, and frankly, even before you break it into more detail, see if you can, if, if there's anything obvious that jumps out at you to change to try to improve those measurements, improve those metrics. And, um like I was saying, measure whether you make a change at the intake phase, but then the key under the theory of constraints is that you also need to measure whether that change had an impact on your overall system, right? So basically, was I, was I able to handle the matter overall more quickly, or did it just get bogged down somewhere else? Because if you make an improvement in the intake phase that you know, does improve your intake time or your um, you know, elapsed time at intake, but it doesn't improve your overall system, then that's an indicator that you, you're not working at the bottleneck, right? And you need to, to maybe pay some closer attention to other parts of your flow. Um, so again, and, and if you try an experiment or if you can't think of an experiment, 
um, that will work based on the information you have, then that's an indication that you may need to break down that intake column into different phases and, and maybe understand where they are. But, you know, again, it, it, it takes some discipline and we like to dig down into the weeds and really try to pull things apart and understand what's happening at a granular level. Um, but I'm a big, a big advocate of starting at the high level, move a little bit lower, see what you can learn at the next level down, make some improvements there. Then if it's still your bottleneck, then dive another level deeper, right, and break it into even more parts. But, you know, my experience so far in working with lawyers is, is that uh, one or two levels of abstraction will yield lots of and lots of potential improvements uh, because we're not often the most efficient uh, folks in the planet. So does that help? Does that get to, to what you were looking for? Yes, it, it does. It is. Yeah. Great. Well, I see we're about out of time. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other things on here that I want uh, to, to make sure we get across. This is um, this is Googleable, but this is uh, sort of the five steps of, of Kanban, right? And And these are not things that you do all at once. These are things that you may do over the course of many months or even a year or two, right? So step one is to visualize your workflow, put your work onto a Kanban board and just look at it. Don't try to change anything, right? Just see what you have. Um, number two, and we didn't really talk about them yet, but apply WIP limits, work in process limits. Um, this is getting at that carrying cost or this inventory problem of having too many things in flight at once and, and having lots of things in flight will make you inherently inefficient. Uh, number three, making policies explicit. That's really the definition of done or the definitions of ready and done, at least at the first level, is understanding what's my policy for moving something through the different stages of workflow. Let's write it down, put it on the wall, right? Manage and measure flow is what I was just talking about. So uh, run an experiment at the phase, see what the outcome of that experiment or you know the outcome of your proposed change is both within that phase, but also overall to your system and then optimize iteratively with data, right? This this whole thing and this whole process and, and part of what I like about an agile approach is that, you know, you would never, at least I would never come in and say, hey, I can make you 15% more efficient by the end of the year. Um, what I would say is let's come up with a, a, a set of methodologies where you can learn how to become maybe 1% more efficient each month. And some months you're going to you're going to hit it. Some months you may fall a little short. Some months you may go over. But all of those improvements will start to compound on each other like interest. And so, you know, in, in my mind, the surest way to have a 15 percent annual improvement is to make lots of small improvements and measure them and validate them and not to do this big bet the company or bet the law firm type implementation on maybe a new software tool or new process or, you know, an expensive Six Sigma consultant or whatever it might be. Um, a few resources, right? I've, I've got a book. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's maybe about half written or maybe a little less than half written uh, because I've been working on some other things, but uh, you can buy it now. It's a minimum viable product. It's available at LeanPub. So that's my, my shameless self plug. Um, you know, I blog at, at uh, legalvaluetheory.com or agileattorney.net slash blog. Uh, and then we've got a Slack group. And, and I don't know, you know, some people, a lot of lawyers are still discovering Slack, but uh, I know Harry's on there and, and several other people. Um, so actually some really kind of heavy hitters in the world of legal operations are, are on there and contributing. Um, really, uh, it's a community for people. Uh, both in big law and small law and in-house who are trying to use agile and lean methodologies to improve their practices. So, uh, you know, I'd highly encourage anyone. I think if you just Google uh, agile attorney Slack group, you'll um, you'll come to my blog post that has the sign up form. Um, and I'll cause you it's, it's just a Google form. There is no automatic sign up for Slack. So uh, eventually I have to do it. So if it's a day or two, I apologize, but uh, I try to process them every day. And I think that's about it. Uh, and it looks like we're right at time. So, oh, I forgot to put your logo on this one, Harry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>